Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Today's guest in the studio, Nash Tackle's very own Billy Elliot himself, none other than London carpet, Jacob Worth. But before Jacob gets in, I never thought this day would happen, but I've managed to pin down Nash resident photographer and ultra carpy Cotswolds boy, Curly, <laughs> Stephen Holdsworth, whatever you want to call him. I'm going to call you Curly. Thanks for coming in, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Yourself? Living the dream. It's good to have you here, mate. <laughs> I never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to talk all things predation, which is a bit of a, yeah, controversial subject. But a lot of your angling over the past 10 years, maybe more, has been based in the Cotswolds. And that region has been pretty synonymous and publicised with various bouts, if you like, of predation, whether that be otters, crayfish, cormorants. Talk to me about your time fishing in that area and how predation has sort of become part of the mainstay. So, yeah, I've been fishing in and around the water park for about 15 years now, I'd say. Uh, And in that short period of time, things have massively changed in the ecosystem around um, from the rivers I grew up fishing as a boy, um, the roach population, finding now that I like to do a bit of fishing for other species in the winter and I'm finding myself more and more now fishing for roach in town centres and around more populated areas because I guess there's, there's less cormorants. Mm. Uh, whereas the kind of off the beaten track parts of the river aren't as prolific as they once were. Uh, and I'm guessing that's had an impact on the pike fishing as well. As a young lad, again, like uh, pike fishing the rivers, there was there was good, healthy populations of pike. Now, struggling, to be honest, um, for anything big anyway. Uh, and then the crayfish. Um, God, we've gone from having no crayfish whatsoever to being inundated. Most lakes now in the water park have a healthy, if not ridiculous amount of crayfish in them <laughs> to the point where you're not fishing real hook baits anymore um and then unfortunately we've got quite a severe otter problem as well on the water park yeah i know that recently colin from st ives was obviously ottered you were on the lake at the time were you not uh i was on one of the other lakes on the complex uh with one of our consultants yeah so they're definitely in there in terms of in terms of the fish stocks over that period of time how detrimental do you think the combination of, of all the predation in the area has been? Uh, it's certainly changed. I mean, 10 years ago, the water park was so up and coming with big fish. Um, and a lot of them, unfortunately, are no more. Like, don't get me wrong. It seems to have reached some sort of natural balance now, I guess. It seems to be less and less otter kills as time's going on. I think nature's maybe finding some sort of balance um it's a difficult for one for me to talk about i guess because as an angler i kind of see myself as a bit of a custodian of the countryside um i love nature i love animals and it'd be unfair for me to say we should eradicate them or Mm. something like that um because you know every animal's got a place in in the ecosystem it's a case in numbers isn't it and concentration of them there's obviously a number of organizations that are active in terms of protecting fisheries. So fencing, there's some embryo waters in the Cotswolds. They're doing a brilliant job. There's the Angling Trust, there's a predation action group. that are all involved in trying to either change legislation or enable anglers to sort of protect their resources and their livelihood if it's a fishery. For you, what have you witnessed in terms of actual sightings of predation whilst you're fishing? Uh, yeah, so my experiences of predation on the water park, God, um, I see otters most time I go fishing, to be fair. Uh, last week or the week before, I had a set of three of them swim swim through my swim, through my lines, um, which is it's a sight to behold. Like, mm. you know, it's just beautiful to see otters, but... At the same time, it's, it's not great for the f- fishing. Right. But they're impressive animals. Aren't <laughs> oh they? yeah, you can't can't deny that they're apex predators, aren't they? They're mm. they're very impressive creatures. So yeah, I actually got got a text this morning off of a uh, one of my mates who's uh, just caught a thirty five pounder out of a very low stocked uh, lake on the park. Uh, unfortunately, that was now missing half of his tail, and that's the second time that fish has escaped an otter. Mm. So it lost its tail four or five years ago. Grew, grew it back and now it's been done again 
it's a lucky escape for him, I guess. But the otter dodger, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> in terms of in terms of things being done in the area to help protect the fish that are there, obviously a lot of the waters that you're talking about are big, vast, not really sort of suitable for fencing without spending an extraordinary amount of money. What, if anything, have you seen to help fish and fishery owners in that area? Uh, I believe that now fisheries that are fenced can get someone in to come and trap otters. Don't, don't quote me on that, but... Yeah, I think I th- there, there is a law where they can... A certain core of people from the environment agency can come and trap mm. an otter and take it, relocate it. Um, a few of the clubs on the park have done fundraisers, carpy nights, slideshows, that kind of thing to help raise funds for uh, for fencing. Uh, I've got a few friends that run fisheries themselves who have just taken it out of their own pocket to, to just get it done because that's their livelihood, I guess, like mm. uh, a, a massive expense to themselves. Um, what else? Uh, there's people like Embryo, obviously, that have uh, recently got a lake in the Cotswold Water Park and they're doing pretty amazing things and hopefully that sh- should be having a fence going around soon and I believe Embryo help out with fencing club club waters as well, don't they? Yeah, they do. I think there's some subsidiaries <clears> that they can give to clubs um, but I, obviously they'd be the people to speak to. A hundred percent, yeah. The, the work they're doing seems amazing. Mm. For you, is it a case of if it's not fenced in that area, it's inevitable or do you think that the balance you talked about before means that if it was left as it is now, it should be okay. I think nature has a has a good way of finding some sort of balance in the end, doesn't it? Um, I'm seeing less and less otter kills every year. Mm. Um, in fact, I actually think that the uh, the prevalence of uh, crayfish in the waters is helping massively with reducing fish casualties. Yeah. Um, they otters seem to love feeding on crayfish. You find big piles of them around all the lakes. So love them or hate them, crayfish are probably actually having... (laughs) Yeah, staving (laughs) off the actual carp harvest. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so in in summary, I guess uh, the water parks suffered massively with predation over the last 15 odd years. Um, Hopefully nature's finding some sort of balance now, but you know, if you're a fishery owner or a club, uh, I'd definitely be looking towards org- organisations like uh, like Embryo or the Angling Trust to to try and help do something. Because I, unfortunately, it's a case of fence it or run the risk of mm. casualties. Yeah, I think it would be um, nice for the uh, the fish that we still have on the water park to kind of be safe from predation. But unfortunately, some of the waters are this. There's not a lot you can do. They're big, windswept, different landowners. Yeah, it's part of the appeal, isn't it? And part of the region in terms of its feature. But predation is there. There are organisations that are able to give you information if you're a fishery owner or if you're looking to fish or if you see predation firsthand, log it, do what we can do, pull together as a community and hopefully with nature finding a balance, with means to be able to fence and also income to support, we can maybe hopefully get on top of the situation. I'd like to think so. There's some amazing fish in the water park. Oh, amazing. I'd love to protect the future of it. I really would because there's some incredible fish, incredible history. Exactly. Carly, you've been a legend, mate. Thank no you for worries. coming on. He was nervous, but he's done <laughs> brilliantly well. I'm going to go and grab Mr. Billy Elliott, Jacob himself, mate. Thanks a lot, bud. No worries. <laughs> Jacob, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Good, mate. You? I'm living the dream. You're Th- here. Thanks for inviting me in. Not at all. Thanks for coming First in. First time seeing the studio. It's lovely. Were you not in here at your last podcast then? No, I was in Kev's old office, I believe, and the whole thing's been renovated. It looks incredible. They all the offices for the other boys. Like walked in, it's all painted grey. It looks wicked. You had the budget experience before then, mate. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. It was nice, but it was different. Where was it now? I can't remember. Your last podcast has got to be what more than a year ago, isn't it? It's Proceeding yeah. lockdown. Yeah, and all that. definitely Kev's. I'm, I want to say Kev's office on the table. Oh, nice. It was now where Alan's is, I believe. Right. Okay. I so, yeah. Well, for those of you that haven't listened to it, 
head back to Series 1 and you'll be able to listen to Jacob's podcast. We're pretty much going to pick up from where that left off. And you left off looking at a houseboat on the river, dancing, pursuing your dream, which was dancing and that whole industry of the arts, mate. Mm-hmm. Very classy. <laughs> he won't tell you, though. He, he actually, I picked him up from the station <laughs> and he had a pret a um, Which, what, like, do, which does not pack? represent my character Dave, whatsoever. So posh. I literally a... was driving here with Brad and I said, I'm going to miss this train, mate. And I was sprinting and the nearest thing was pret. I was like... Grab a butty, grab this, I need to get there. A butty. Yeah. No, I don't eat pret normally. I'm not that posh. Edamame bean salads only, mate, this guy. And he offered me some cashew nuts as soon as I got in. I did actually add some of them. Which were protein. Bag. Guilty. Um, we're going to pick up from that, basically, and talk about your fishing sort of over the lockdown period to this point now, because quite a lot has gone on, hasn't it, mate? It's been a crazy year. <laughs> so, my literally, my head is just like, so much has gone on. It's been a crazy year. Definitely the busiest year of my life ever. Yeah. Talk to me about lockdown. What what did you do? What happened over that lockdown period, picking up from pretty much where you left off on the last podcast? So I believe the na- the last podcast was early March, I believe. So mm. that would have been before we knew of any lockdown. Um, I remember at the time I was um, checking out one of the lakes on Walthamstow at the time, um, getting ready for a spring campaign on there. And it just was getting worse on social media. Like everyone was going, oh, this is happening. I remember getting phone calls off friends going, oh, I know someone in the military. Like there's going to be army on the streets. You can't go anywhere. I literally called my mum and said, if this happens and it goes into lockdown, I'm not being stuck in London. Um, Because I'd lived with my girlfriend's uh, mum for quite a long time after college. So she went on a cruise ship and I lived with her mum for that whole time. So spent a lot of time with her mum. And then when Stacey came back, I stayed there. And it was like one of those, I feel like, not felt like I was intruding, but mm. I'd been there a while and it was like, if there was going to be a lockdown stuck there, I felt a, a bit bad, if you know what I mean, to be stuck in the house. So I said to mum, look, I need to, basically, if there's a lockdown, like I feel like it, it's best for work as well. I'm not going to have any work with the shop because that would, I assume that would have been closed in the aquarium I worked at. So yeah, and then out of nowhere it happened and they said, oh, this is going to be, there's going to be a lockdown. So I just packed my bags really quickly out of nowhere, kind of a, sporadic decision got the train home with all my fishing gear obviously yeah yeah obviously. <laughs> first thing i packed all my rods like suitcase full of clothes two pairs of boxes and one t-shirt and all my fishing gear <laughs> got there and i'd arranged to actually fish a canal like one i'd not fished for probably five or six years like a really nice little canal near to home i got off the train and my mum and dad were like super paranoid about the virus which obviously fair enough because my dad's nearly set well he's 70 okay um and my mum's 65 well my dad's older i think he's nearly 80 now getting on a bit um so yeah i got there and my mum said look i'd prefer if you could sort of self-isolate for a little bit so i planned to stay at a canal for a week just to self-isolate on a canal that's just a great place to get, self-isolate. get into get, got up north off the train mum dropped me off just literally sat at the back of the car with a mask on got to the canal just to be on the safe side because we didn't know how bad this was at the time. It was just all kind of a scaremonger thing. Mm. Got there, um, one night in, the weather was awful. It was like minus three as well. <laughs> the worst March ever. I was freezing on the canal. I went to my mum, it's not looking good. I can't do a week here, mum, I'm freezing. Um, and then the, Boris announced it, the yeah. old lockdown, that horrible announcement, yeah. Um, and I was fishing at the time, obviously, and I think it was about, to 10 o'clock at night my mum messaged me saying have you seen the announcement I quickly went on and looked and it was like you must stay at home and all that rubbish so then I had to go home I was forced to go home mm. my plan was then to sleep in the garden in my bivy self-isolate in the garden in the garden nice so I was going to do like stupid lives to keep me busy even though I'm casting into buckets which worked for a couple of days and then that sort of wore off and then in the end I, my mum let me in the house <laughs> did she she caved <laughs> Yeah, she, my mum's not strict in any way, but it was just like we, they were so worried about because obviously they're both elderly and stuff and my mum was caring for her, her dad, which is obviously my granddad. That's understandable. Yeah, so that happened. Um, and then, yeah, like lockdown, supposed to be like this two, three week thing that I was expecting to go back to London and pick up my life again. And then I was, mm. I think I was there seven, eight weeks, two months. Um, they allowed fishing. So when I think that was, was that um, four or five weeks in? Yeah. So oh, before that, I was already walking around all these canals I'd fished as a kid and all these places I'd caught like my first 20 from and like these really nice canals, which compared to London, aren't, they're completely different. Like London's like gin clear, no small fry, just the odd big carp. 
Yeah. And up north is like green, muddy water. Can't find them. But give me too much tea, mate. Sorry, mate. It's a good, t- it's a good brew, though. <laughs> good tea, it? yeah. Whereabouts up north is it? Specifically? It's Cheshire. Cheshire. So yeah. Nantwich. So I was literally going, just before they allowed fishing again, I was going around all the canals, mm. all the old spots, which obviously was great, brought back loads of memories. And I found a few really nice fish, like upper 20s. And I was like, oh, then I was buzzing to get out. They allowed fishing. I went out. Um, I caught a few really nice ones, like filmed a little bit of it, made a little vlog that I put on YouTube. Um, so I was really enjoying it. It was just nice to be at home. Went to a few like older state lakes, fish like for some really nice dark fish. They're all kind of smaller fish. There's a lot of really nice mares up that way though, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, just nice places. And it was just like really refreshing to get out of the city for a little bit of time and sort of do something slightly different. And then I was calling my friend Mike Tobin. Um, you might, Carp angle Mike Carp Tobin. angle Mike Tobin, yeah, yeah editor. Um, and I was pestering him the whole time, mate, we need to buy a boat been sat at home so long now I'm just I've got this thing I have to buy a boat and all this kind of thing and he was like yeah we'll try and he was viewing boats on the Thames for me because he lives near the Thames and I was obviously stuck up north he was viewing boats and I was Mm. like we'll go halves on it and all this and in the end nothing came like came out of it and um because at this point you haven't got the houseboat have you no houseboat no houseboat so on the sorry on the last Nash podcast I did you were looking we were looking at one that's right so the winter gone I was doing a performing job and me and Stacey were looking for somewhere to move out of her mum's to live together. Yeah. Lockdown happened, cancelled all that yeah. plan. So just as the lockdown's eased, I'm up north with my family and I'm fishing on one of the last nights I've got before I'm planning on sort of making my way back to London. And my mate went, oh, um, my uncle's got a boat fishing. Like it'd be perfect for fishing. It's a little cruiser. And I was like, let me see that. Mm. Went straight there. It was in his garden. It, freshly painted had an outboard engine on it already was called King Fisher god it's meant to be meant to be ridiculous look and then you wanted £800 for it with an engine and the boat was all in working order just needed a few little tweaks so obviously I grabbed that up straight away and then decided that I had a trip to Ashmead booked at the end of June so I thought let me just stay here not go to London and I'll just work on this boat up until the trip to Ashmead and then take the boat back to London that's what I did finished the trip at Ashmead and got some just paid some a friend of a friend to literally trailer this little fishing boat all the way to London with no. me. Yeah, like a four hour drive of a boat. We um <laughs> oh like ten minutes into the drive, I was so nervous about getting it there. Yeah. Ten all that time, ten minutes into the drive, it was all smoking. All what coming was? up and I was like, Oh my God, what is going on? Called my brother in law works for a garage and he went, Yeah, you've got the um you've got the trailer what the brake on, brake on the trailer just burning it out she went outside and the tyres were melting <laughs> in the inside of the tyres where we had the brakes on the trailer we'd done like done like five miles mate so oh. like it was stressful but we got there um, I put it on the canal up in London um, and yeah like planned and then things just were crazy back in London was yeah. then viewing this houseboat again starting back up in the shop so you've just, gone from no boats to potentially two boats to two uh, yeah so end of June Fishing boat came to London, start of July, viewed the houseboat, said, look, if we don't get it now, we're going to miss this opportunity. Let's mm-hmm. just get it. Maybe rushed into it looking back, but bought this houseboat, me and Stacey on, on the docks, which I fish, I'd also fished before in London, like wicked venue. So I was just like super sort of fished up by that point, two boats to fish off. And I was like, so you'd no. put, you'd put the fishing boat which you'd nearly melted the tyres off the trailer. You'd put that where, mate? Where'd that go? So I took that into central, um, okay. With the intention of sort of fishing the Regent's Canal, the Riverley, um, right up and down, just sort of milling around. I got like a cruiser license. And how do, how does that how does that work? Can anybody get a license? Yeah, so anyone can get a license. You just need to get a survey and an insurance, and you just get a Canal and River Trust license. And basically, you'd either find a mooring on said venue, the canal or the river, yeah, um, which would cost a lot of money, or you get like a cruising license, which is is called continuous cruising. So every two weeks you have to move. It's right, a, it's a real ball. Like it's like the the worst thing about me having that boat. Every two weeks, I've got to go there, and if you don't, you get like a snotty email. Your license will be terminated if you don't move it. And you're obviously on fish baiting, and you see the big in there. And then next day, you've got to drive four miles away. Otherwise, you, got, so otherwise, you, so you can't just rock around the corner. No, they're funny with it. You've got to go in one direction continuously. I think I can't remember the exact breakdown, but you've got to go continuously for six miles or something to cover a certain amount of space throughout the season or whatever. You can't go. 100 yards that way and 100 yards back, you have to keep going in that direction. Oh. Luckily, because of the lockdown, they, they cancelled the movement, so you didn't have to move. You could just stay in one spot. 
Um, but now they've put it back in on again and now I'm going to have to move it. So that's the downside with having a fishing boat. But other than that, it's just incredible. Dude, like yeah. that when I get a day off, I go down, driving up and down. Even not even when I'm not fishing, it's just so nice and peaceful, just away from everything. I suppose that's a complete contrast to maybe what's on the towpath, which is absolute madness. And that's you, why I got it, to yeah. be honest. Obviously, originally I wanted fish on the Thames with the boat. Um, but looking back, that wouldn't have been a great idea because the Thames is still quite a bot for me to get to from Central. Okay. So this worked out perfect and it's the places where the areas that I fish, you'd never fish from the towpath. Nice. That's the reason why they're not fished. Why not? God, it's just not safe. I've Go been, on, I've been, me. so I've been one night, um, I was, I was pulling my boat up, um, not fishing in that area, but I was driving the boat as close as possible so I could fish Walthamstow and I was sort of walking, walking up to Walthamstow, uh, getting a little buzz and walking and like four lads surrounded me on bikes. What? Like all hooded up, and I had my camera, my Sony camera around my waist, mm. wallet, phone, keys, the lot. And I, as soon as he come up to me, I just sprinted straight at him and just barged through the middle of them and just hoped because I thought there's no hope. It's either I run the opposite way and they catch me, I jump in with the camera and it all breaks, yeah. or I, or they pull out a knife and say give me everything. So it's and that was just me walking five minutes just down the path to get to get to Walthamstow. So you ran straight at ran them. straight at me because he. They, they come off on a narrow canal path. One came round, and as soon as the one at the back pulled sideways on his bike, I knew they were blocking me. Yeah. So as soon as he pulled sideways and the other one come over, he was like, hi, where are you from? So, and as soon as he s- said that, I knew if I said anything and they heard my northern accent, it'd be even worse. So I just literally sprinted straight away, where are you from? Run at them. And then they didn't have time to do anything because they were so close to me, and I just sort of got God. through them and then ran. And I got away with it, mate. They could have took everything. So that's, yeah. And that's me just walking. So if you actually fish there and put a bivy up... Yeah. I don't think they'd harm you in that sense or even take your fishing gear, but they'd want your phone or... It's not a relaxing night fishing, No, it's just it? a really busy around the area and there's a lot of people around there that you don't want to be sort of around at night time. So it's not... That's the problem with London as well, like making sure you can fish places that are safe and you sort of have to time places to make sure that you are safe because that's obviously more important than the fishing, making sure you're, you're safe out there. Mm. So. What what other stuff have you encountered in terms of your time on there? Has it been... Has it been pretty much not I'm not going to say organised gangs I feel like I'm on some crime podcast at the moment but you know what I mean is it is it is it groups of, of, of lads or is it general public or, or no it's yeah it's groups of lads just looking for a quick opportunity to get some money steal your phone it's yeah it's kind of happens in London I remember when I was in in dance college even there there was like constant emails going out around the college oh there's a lad on a on a push bike right he'll go past and I got had my phone snatched it's actually a really funny story I was working at Harrods at the time, part time. Of course, he yeah, was working at Harrods, <laughs> selling fragrance. I bet you'd be great at that, mate, wouldn't yeah, you? It was the longest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah, awful, but yeah, that happened. Finished Harrods. I was on my way back to um, to the flat I was renting at the time, and I was at a bus stop playing that stupid pinball game on my phone, leaning against the bus stop, and literally playing this game. Gone phone. And this was like I remember it was like. Three days before Christmas, I was due to get a train home to see my family. I had my mum's Christmas presents in my bag oh, and I was going home to take a present and whatever. Phone gone. He went off on the bike and I, I was in a suit and everything and I thought, there's no way he thinks I'm chasing him. I'm chasing him. I'm not losing that phone. I literally took my took my bag off, took my, I was going to swear then, poo flickers, You're smart right. shoes off. <laughs> yeah. Flicked them off and just said to the, the people at the bus stop, please can you look after my bag for me? And I literally ran in a suit sort of really low, chased after this guy. And I could see he'd slowed down. He thought there was no way I was ever going to chase him. And round the corner, I got to him and he was in front of his own house, about to let himself in with my phone in his hand. And I just went, oi, from behind him. And because he knew that I'd seen him at his house, he just threw the phone at me and biked off. And I was like, but that happens so much in London. Like people, if you're on your phone, you're walking down the street, just gone. That sounds great, doesn't it? It's just a nightmare. In the countryside, you'd hardly ever get that. What about when you fish it? Fishing, I've not had any issues, really. No. People have, but I think there's, there is that weird aspect of if you're walking down the street with your phone, it's an easy pickings. If you if mm. there's a tent up and everything and you're fishing, like, you could be a bit of a madman. Yeah. And they have to kind of break into your space to take anything. Like, say if you're... That's why I don't really fish without a bivy in London. Because, say, if you're, um, if you're in a tent, they've got to come in the tent to ask you to say anything to you and they, they you might be an absolute lunatic in that tent 
It's a bit of a barrier, isn't it? Yeah, that's the barrier. So I've never had any trouble and I've, I would say it's probably mainly that reason because I know people that have been robbed and things taken, but I think it's not bad for getting your gear stolen in London. No. People don't really steal your fishing gear, not like some lakes where they come up in vans and take you, mm. turn your bike lumps off and rob all your gear. It's more like just drunken people. I went fishing with them. Um, it's a funny story, another one. I think I told this story in the last podcast, but I'm going to quickly tell it again. Nathan, iPhone Carpers. Yeah. He come down to London, never met him before. We we're exchanging messages on Instagram. And he said, oh, let's have a let's have a social in London. We went down to Shadwell Basin. It's a little dock in the middle of London off the Thames, quite a lot of fish. And we were there and at like two in the morning, some drunk guy come past the bivvy banging on the Titan. Nash this, nash that, uh, uh, banging on the bivvy. And I sort of woke up. What's going on here now? Alfie. <laughs> I, w- I woke up and I went, hello, what's up, mate? You all right? And he could tell he was drunk. So I just entertained it just so he didn't lose his head. And he was, oh, oh, oh. I went, all right, mate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nathan on the other hand, he's got no like... He doesn't take any rubbish like that. Like I'm a little bit tolerant. I can sort of just have a laugh with him and pretend nothing's happened. Nathan was waking up the whole time. Anyway, he was going, nah, yes. And then he, he muttered something about robbing gear. And I knew he wasn't going to do anything. He couldn't even walk. Yeah. But Nathan heard about robbing gear. And he just, Nathan just suddenly popped up because the bivvies were facing out to the lake. He was behind and I was talking to him. Nathan just popped up and went, rob whose gear? Nathan was mad, yeah. And he was like, you better get lost and all this. And then this other guy come over and was like, calm down, I know him. These lads are all right, leave them alone. Nathan's not having it, mate. But he's from, he plays rugby, he's from outside the city, he's not used to all that rubbish. Yeah. Most people are not. No. If you're fishing and someone's giving you aggro, they'd probably stick it on them and say, what are you doing? Yeah. But I'm just used to that rubbish. Like, it's just... What about public? That always like, you've done a fair bit on, on some of the parks. Yeah. You've done a fair bit on some of the river systems, etc. I always feel that like, in terms of, I mean, this is different in terms of fet and stuff, but in terms of just general fishing, the public are quite the, I can imagine they're quite split. You've got some people that really want to see what you're doing. Mm. Some people that are really sort of maybe animal rights activists and stuff yeah, thinking what's going on. That gets me down, on. man. I'll be honest with you. That gets to me a little bit. Um, say busy park lakes that I've fished before. Like you say, you get that mix. Some people come over. Oh, wow. Mm. Is that in here? Did you catch that from here? <laughs> He's like, no, I carried it from 10 miles away. <laughs> but yeah, like some of them are just intrigued. They're shocked. They don't expect it to be there. It's a lake they've walked around for 10 years and they've never seen a fish. And they're like, Jesus, is that in there? Yeah. Which is fine. I let them take a picture. I just say, please don't put it on Facebook and that kind of thing. But then you always get the odd one that's just like a Karen in the social media. That's what they say. A, a Karen. Karen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and where they're like, that's cruel. Look at it, it can't breathe, put it back. And they're trying to touch the fish and try and get in your way and sort of grab and stuff like that. And again, I'm quite, I'm not like an aggressive person. It takes a lot for me to like switch and get annoyed. Mm. So I'm just like, oh, it's all right. Like as long as its gills are wet and it's wet and we get it back in the water, it's fine. We treat it if there's any sort of damage to it. But that some of them just not having it, are they? They don't care. They just want to keep going on and on and on. And that's, that is a big downside, I'd say, because that stuff kind of gets to me a little bit. I shouldn't do, but it does. Yeah. And they're saying, oh, you're harming the creature and they're filming me, my face and all that. It's not what you want. Do you get it? that as in like phone culture yeah, where they yeah, go loads. and put it yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're poaching, then it's a different story. That You get the people who are like, you can't fish here and they're filming you and that's just is what it is. You take that risk. But if it's somewhere where you're allowed to fish and you've got people coming up to you and you're there to have a good time and stuff and they're sort of making you feel bad about it. I had one guy, he wouldn't leave me alone for about half an hour. What, just... He was going, he feel like, everything I said, he was like, why'd you do it? I was like, because I love carp fishing, get out, it gets in the outside, it's something to sort of motivate me, something to do. And he was like, well, if you love the fish, why don't you just scuba dive and look at them? Why'd you have to harm them and all this? He was going at me and was like, like going to like kick my rods and all that. It's crazy, mate, honestly. But I suppose, in a way though, that is quite a powerful position to be in with regards to maybe... And I know Alan does it really well with regards to when he's fishing busy park lakes and mm. you yourself do. When there is people there that are that probably don't have an opinion that's formed on any experience. Yeah, they just you're 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 the first port of call in terms of the first time maybe they've ever seen somebody yeah. carp fishing. And I think that's a that's probably quite a big issue within the carp fishing industry is a lot of people are uh, too sort of aggressive with it all. Mm, it's hard. If you have a little it's hard, yeah. If you have a little I think if you have a little bit more time for people then because you do get some people that are just inquisitive and they're just genuinely asking what, oh, do you put them back? And 
what, why do you yeah. take a picture and let them go? What's the point? And I try and explain it and say, look, you'd probably really enjoy it. It's, it's a reason to go out and something to look forward to. And you wake up with that kind of, oh my God, I would love to catch that fish. And some of them are like, oh, cool. And they love it. If you're just like, oh, a bit miserable, it puts yeah. that stereotype on fishermen where like, oh, they're antisocial and all this. And it doesn't help when, no. you, when you go into said places where you're not supposed to be fishing. If you go to somewhere you're not supposed to be fishing, you're really polite to everyone. Chances are you'll you'll be fine. But if you're like, someone comes over and goes, you can't fish in, you go, F off. Yeah. Which is what does happen because some people are like, leave me alone, which is fair enough. Like, just worry about yourself. But me personally, I'm not really like that. And I feel like I have to explain myself to everyone, which is a painful experience when there's 50 people a day coming up to you every time you catch one. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's mad, mate. The you- other day I was fishing, I caught one and my girlfriend was there filming it all. And I was like, it's done like four nights with her. She was helping me film it all. And we were both absolutely knackered. We caught one finally. And we had this lovely scale. It was fighting in the edge. And she said, look behind you. And I looked. There's about 30 people yeah. clapping when it went in the net. And I was like, oh, that's good. But luckily they couldn't get to me because I was down on a platform. So with that, it's fine. But other times it's, yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. You mentioned there previously when you were talking about go fishing and, and sort of being able to fish again during lockdown. You talked about Ashmead. Yeah. Now, I probably couldn't pick two more contrasting venues than mm. Ashmead, yeah. incredible carp, rural, beautiful. And then somewhere like the Docklands, urban, yeah. concrete, like not a piece of green for yeah. miles. Well, that's the crazy thing because people like uh, my Instagram, London Carper. Yeah. Like... I went to a lake a few weeks ago, a little park lake, and it was just in the middle of a, of um, it was in the middle of forests, and it was just a nowhere near any buildings. It was beautiful, weedy, old, nice, old, old carp in there, and that was I was in my element. I loved it. So there's not, I don't really think I like like urban fishing as such. I think the main jump for me to f- how I fished before and how I fish now is only because of just time, mm. um, location, and timing, and because I moved here for performing. I didn't even fish for two years. I didn't think you could fish in London. I didn't think there was any venues. And a lot of people are still like that now. They go, where would you fish in London? A good friend of mine, Alpar, um, he's moved over to London not so long ago and he's like, there's nowhere to fish. I'm like, mate, there's a 40 outside where you work, work there. You just haven't looked properly. Mm-hmm. But they just don't see it. And I think for that, like me, I'd love like that, them wild places. Ashmead is beautiful. It's incredible. I'm going again at the end of this month, booked in. I, I have a booking every year on there. When I go there, I just love it. It's nothing yeah. better. But then there's also something in it for those little urban places, not even urban, just places where other people find too much effort to go and fish. Like you have to get a bus and a train, you can't park there and you're not necessarily allowed to fish there, but you're not harming anyone. You're doing your thing at night and leaving in the morning and there's really nice carp in there. That thing gets me motivated because of the fish you can catch and the style and the way you fish there. Like what it is for me that I don't like is nothing to do with the scenery, really. Obviously that helps, but it's more just like... I can't do with like data kits. I can't, I just, it really depresses me. I went to Farlow's and I caught, I caught fish like years ago, caught some really nice carp. And, and at the end I just felt really deflated. I just think with, when there's all people around me, it takes away from me what I enjoy with fishing, which is that kind of escaping and the wild kind of campaign for certain fish. So I think wherever I went, I'd find that, you know, whether yeah. it was urban or not or whatever kind of thing. That's your niche. That sort of yeah, campaign. So like feel. Ashmead, like it's a, four yeah. people go at once and it's like this massive lake all with islands channels bays and the guys I go with they're all like they're all like ma- not match fishermen course fishermen so they're not carp anglers specimen carp anglers so I'm the only one there that's like hunting the carp and it just feels amazing I, I could live there for a, a year <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah it's complete contrast but I feel like it doesn't I'm not like an urban angler and that's kind of that's not what I enjoy it's just the, that the certain fish that come with that is what I enjoy if that's it. what about the whole location of fish in London itself. How do you get to know about certain areas that are that could hold fish? Like, do you do you bait and see what turns up, or have you got intel from from other people? Because on the face of it, it's very sort of secret squirrel, clicky, yeah. yeah, and clicky. Um, I'd say it's a bit of both. Right. It's one thing I find really hard because some people do message me asking me for help with venues and stuff and I just feel like I, it's not kind of, I feel like it's hard to not reply or to say no but then to give venues away is also an issue and 
I don't know, it's, it is clicky. I'm not clicky. I'm not funny about people fishing. If I turned up and someone's fishing my bait, I wouldn't be in any way funny with them. I'd just be a bit gutted and go elsewhere. But there is people out there that are, their life depends on that and they're not on social media. They're not on anything. It's all about that fish. And if you get in the way of that, then there's big trouble. And I think in London with it being, as, although it's a big city, it's a small it's a small place. Everyone knows everyone and it can be a bit of a trouble in that sense. But I don't know. There's... There's a, when I first started, the first ever place I fished in London, like I said, I didn't have a clue. Mm. If I'm honest, I think I was I was renting a flat. I had no fishing gear in London whatsoever. And I went on YouTube, fishing in London. And you'd get like the old Nash videos, Alfie on um, Hamstead Heath. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you'd get, and then I saw a, one of the corder videos of Danny Fairbrass landing the big one from Walthamstow. And I went, Angel to Walthamstow, tube. What? That's half an hour from where I am now. Mm. I thought, I can fish that. What's stopping me fishing there? So I got all my gear from up north, started going to Walthamstow, and that wasn't really my thing, but it was, I think I fished there two years or a year after the fish kill. Yeah. So it was dead. No one was fishing there. So it was nice in that sense. I could do what I wanted, but it was like January minus two. So Started at the hardest, started at like the hardest possible venue in the worst weather. But yeah, the first real fish I caught in London, just walked up the canal. Walked up the canal five minutes from my college in central London and I saw a shoal of bream and I was excited by that. I know that's like noddy now. No. <laughs> bream banks. But yeah, at the time I walked up, there was luck because I used to do a bit of dabbled in match fishing. I never did it like on a big stage, but I sort of did little bits of match fishing here and there. And I enjoyed that pole fishing, catching small fish, feeder fishing for bream. Mm. And I saw these clonking nine, 10 pound bream in a canal. <laughs> I thought, Jesus Christ, they were never up north in the canal. Four pounds, like a donkey of a bream <laughs> so I was like all these bream crystal clear water I remember filming them and going look at that bream and now I laugh it's just embarrassing but I, f- I heard I saw them and then because I, I was there all the time looking at them and trying to see if there was carp obviously I saw someone and he went oh there's a few carp then I started baiting and I got super lucky I went down I had some stupid yellow tip on the carp rod I had at the time like a yellow feeder carp rod some broken reel I went there and just plonked a bottom bait rig on top of these boilies I'd been thrown in after college, put the rod down. My mate, who was a dancer, had no care about fishing whatsoever. I was just sat there at one in the morning. This is boring, mate. Like in the middle of the city, all traffic shum, going past. Rod rips off. 24 pound common. Nuts. Jet black out of a canal. Blown away. I was like, what the hell? That was my PB. Yeah. And I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, th- th- no one's even fishing here. No. What could be in here? And then from then on, like, I just knew that, and I'd, even the people on that canal, they led me astray, oh, there's only that one in here, this is the place to go. This, and after that, I just thought, I'm going to fish this canal relentlessly until I've caught everything. I want to see everything that's in here. And then I went on to catching, like, nine fish out of that stretch, like, up to 28 pound, all, like, really cool fish. And then from then on, just sort of flipped around everywhere. Yeah. Is that part they got fishing? Let's have a look. And then someone would catch a 40, and I'd go, oh, I know that fence. It just goes from there, really. Yeah. Like, no one will tell you everything, but you can sort of find out bits and bobs. How's that gone for you in recent times with regards to, obviously, you've got a really active social media presence. You've done a fair bit of coverage with regards to fish you've caught. How has that been sort of received with regards to the rest of the angling community around London? Has that gone down well? Has that not stood in your favour at all? Oh, it's bad. It's bad, and I get it because what I've just said previously about the whole don't really give venues away, you have to figure it out for yourself. I can imagine if I'd figured something out for myself and found these fish years ago, mm. caught these amazing fish, and there's still a few to catch, and some young lad comes down, catches some, makes a video, puts it everywhere, and there's 10 people there. It's like, oh, why? Mm. You want fame, you want glory. But it was never about, oh, I want to be a known angler or anything like that. It was just, I really enjoyed, like, the first, that first video I ever made on my YouTube channel was, I caught that fish and I was blown away and I propped my, fo- my phone up on the floor, mm-hmm. lifted it up and went, look at that. <laughs> then I thought I made a little silly edit on my phone. And I just really enjoyed watching back the journey of all these fish I was catching. And then it went on to making videos and, but yeah, it doesn't help at all. And that is one, that's one thing I've definitely struggled with in terms of like, since my journey moving to London with the fishing. Yeah. But it's like... The one side of me is like, oh man, like, do I feel bad on the anglers if I make a video there? And the other side of me is like, well, so what? 
like I have to be a little bit selfish. Everyone does. Like if they had the opportunity to make a video, make something out of their dream job or like they had an opportunity to do what they loved mm. and not have to work as much or do something more than, then they'd probably do the same thing. That's how I kind of see it in another sense. But finding the balance between the two it's has hard. been really hard. And I try and like respect all the anglers on the place I'm fishing as much as possible by like reducing the amount of content I put out. Like some places I fish, I don't make a single video, I don't post the fish mm. because I know that it's big trouble if I do. And it just caused me more miver than it's worth. But then I love making videos and I love like all the positive feedback is like nine out of 10 positive. I love the videos where are you doing more? I love watching them. And for them people and the, the sake of me loving making it, I think I just have to put the negative things to one side and just carry on doing what I love. So yeah. Yeah. It's a hard, but it is really hard. Anywhere else it's easy. Like even for Alan, um, I said I, like I said to Alan like when we went we done a bit of filming, um, and he was like, "Oh, what's wrong with filming that?" And I was like, "Well, you're gone after, and I'm still here." Yeah. So it's like, and Alan's obviously always on the move, and I'm sure Alan's had loads of negative, but he's super positive, so he can just brush it off. Don't care. Like I'm doing what I love. I don't care. And that's you need that thick skin, I think, mm. to do it. But it's like, for me, because I'm so stuck in central London, zone five, 10, 15 venues, some of them I'm after a target fish, other people are also after it. If I catch a few and, and make a video before I've had the target fish or even after and ruin their fishing, it just brings trouble back to me because I'm in that tight bubble. If you're going everywhere, if I went to, drove out to Scotland and fished some random secret lake and put it all over YouTube, I wouldn't have any, just be a few social media threats and that'd be it. Just a few but, social... But in, in London, it's like serious. It's not just like a message on Instagram, oh, you idiot. It's like you might bump into that person and if you've really upset them because you've you've baited out the lake they're fishing, it's like you have to... It's really hard, man, it is, to, to balance it. But I'm not going to not do something that I love because of someone... Because at the end of the day, we're all carp fishing. Yeah. And, and the worst case is I'm inspiring more people to go carp fishing, yeah. which upsets one person who doesn't want more people to go there but I'm making so many people happy and one person sad. So that's the other side of it. It's just, what do you think about like, the whole? I think it's very hard. I think it is very hard. I think you're never going to please everyone in anything you do in life, are you? I think you, you, it's up to you to draw the line wherever you see fit. And what what is a contributing factor is that your income is based on, on what you catch. You, like A lot of your social media audience, a lot of the stuff that you do is, is based on that. So you're going to have to publicise. That, and that's the hard thing is... If I still fish to make videos up north in crew, mm. chances are probably no one would care. No one would probably watch, a couple of people watch the videos. Oh, cool. Same as everyone else. And I wouldn't probably have any kind of following or people wouldn't really care about what I'm doing. And I probably wouldn't get any stick. But like Carl and Alex are one of the only people who have like smashed it from fishing like the Tan Yards fishery. Yeah. Like and getting big views, and then they started going these little park lakes, and then blowing, blowing up, like just doing incredibly well. But it's super, super hard to get any. If you put a video on a generic park lake, hardly any views on it. Go into this kind of delve into this London thing, which I was never intended on doing, and there's loads of interest. Oh my god, where's that? Where's this? So I've been unlucky in the sense of I've probably had a lot of negative because of the style that I do. But that's a style that people follow me to do. Yes, if you get yeah, what yeah, I mean. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like if you it's what your audience wants. It's like Tom Maker probably gets. I can't see Tom Maker getting death threats for making videos on linear, because it's busy and that's yeah. what it is. And people fish next to him all the time, and he goes there, and other people go there, and it's that's just is what it is. But when you're fishing for like a special carp, and there's not many fish in the lake, and you're jeopardising someone else's chances of catching that fish, then it becomes more personal, and you're personally annoying that per, and then it mm. just. So yeah, I can see it. It's a I hard one. It. it is a hard one. And, and that's also, why I can't wait to go out and do a bit more on other places where I won't be getting that kind of, I won't have to worry. Yeah. Like I say to all the Nash boys, they're like, oh, can we film there? And I'm like, I can't. Yeah. I can't. And I want to because it, it makes such a really cool video and a film, but you just sometimes... It, yeah, it, it's tricky. It's, you're in a tricky spot. And as God, you it's say... It's hot in here, isn't it? Yeah, mate. It's hot. I'm grilling you. It's going to be Last month, up. I bet it, it was raining, freezing cold, and now it's just sweltering. It goes, yeah, there's no middle ground in it, mate. It's either it's absolutely doing my buttons in a minute. Go on the... <laughs> it's that kind of show. Um, no, but I, I completely get your, your sort of point of view, but I also, yeah, you're in a very difficult position with regards to, to that whole publicity element. You're, you're also it, sort of in a facet of angling that is, that is so 
popular and sort of fashionable that you're actually getting instead of like inherently people around London fishing those waters, you're getting people coming in. In to fish there. That's fish the it. worst part of it. Which is... Because people go, oh, I've seen your video. Oh, where's yeah. that? Can I come and fish there? And it's yeah. like, I'm like, oh, brilliant that they like the video. Bad, because what the people, are, the negative comments I'm getting is because of that exact thing. I'm bringing people in. But... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, what it's what can you do? Of course, yeah, exactly. Do I can't do I cancel or not make any more videos? Delete social media and just fish for the love, which I would, could do. I love fishing. I do it regardless. But then I need a full time job, mm. and I can't. Like I've my main thing in life is like I'm like this weird thing with working. I'm like I have to. My main goal in life, I don't care about cars and money and all that crazy stuff. All I care about is doing day to day things that I want to do which is so hard and even in my family like all my family work none of them I'm like why don't you go and what do you want to do what's the if you could pick one thing you could do what would it be and it's like they'd be like oh I'm fine I'm just working I've got kids I'm enjoying myself and I'm like I can't like Mm. if I want to do like wildlife photography and travel the world I'd have to try and zone in on that to get that to be my job where do you think that's come from I don't know because my family aren't like that yeah in terms of like they're not Self, a self-employed family yeah. I think it came from performing from being a dancer yeah. and the people in the performing arts industry generally are quite open-minded in terms of that everyone in college is dancing and that's good that the aim is to make it to the top in that field and get paid to do what they love anyway yeah so it's like and it's brutal isn't it yeah and it's like if you can do what you love and get paid for it then you never work yeah winning. so when that when the dancing kind of simmered a bit for me it's not that the dancing went down, it's that the fishing went up. So where are we with dancing now, mate? You still gone. there? Gone. Gone. <laughs> I've just gone. given it the Billy Elliot hype, mate, and you've crushed my dreams. <clears throat> Completely gone. Not. So just before that lockdown came about, no, actually, throughout the lockdown, I was still singing at home with my mum and dad and singing, sending self-tapes to my agent and I was, I had a few setbacks after college and I nearly got jobs and then never got them and mm. nearly did tours and never got them and for whatever reasons. And after the lockdown, a lot of time to think and I just thought, theatres aren't open. Yeah. It's going to take ages to rebuild. I've been three years out of college. I've done jobs, but not significant jobs so that I've got an amazing CV. I either go at, because in college I was so driven and like, doing every free sign-up class possible out of hours. And then I just lost that buzz for it. And I thought, and I had that buzz for fishing, which is weird because fishing was never, ever meant to be that kind of thing. So I just thought this doesn't feel right. And I called my agent and I said, look, I think it's best that I don't lie to you and get you to send me to auditions and then make you look like an idiot because he's obviously representing me. And if I dance badly or look like I'm not really feeling it in the room, it looks bad on him. So I said, look, this is my honest thing. Like, I don't think for the next few years it's something that I want to be doing. And the fishing's taken off. Fishing, then obviously then I could concentrate on the fishing. And since then it's obviously got, the fishing's gone up. And But I'm hoping that the fishing gets to a level where I can sort of go back into the dancing and train again and sort of try and get some jobs. But I'd, I'd be then in a position where I wouldn't have to do jobs for exposure and do jobs for terrible money just to get seen. I could just only go to the auditions for the jobs that I'd love to do. Mm. Like there's loads of shows and in the musical theatre industry, like you'd have to do a job for hardly any money, just get paid expenses, just so one casting director sees you and he may put you in his big show that's next year. And it's like, really? But now if I was, if I'm getting paid to do something I love aside from dancing, I could just say to my agent, I only want those, those auditions, Saturday Night Fever and the West End and Thriller and all these kind of Grease and all the really cool shows that I've always wanted to do that gives me a buzz when I step on the stage that is the kind of thing that I could go into after. And it wouldn't be about money then. Saturday Night Fever in the West End or a £40 uncaught Thames fish? What are you going for? Now? Yeah. Thames fish? Yeah. I can see it, man. Right now, because that's where I, my head's at. But if I started training again, it'd be Saturday Night Fever. Would it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because I'm really weird like that. Whatever I start doing, I... Because you said it like whatever you whatever you're passionate in, you don't work, and and that's important to you. Mm-hmm. But essentially, 
the sacrifices you make to do that rubbish job for a casting director to see you is the same sort of sacrifice that you make to work within the fishing industry when oh, you're yeah, starting yeah. out. You'll go and do... Of course, do... like the fishing industry is like so hard to get work in because companies that sell fishing tackle are big brands in themselves and they're doing an angler a favour by representing them because they're giving them a bigger platform. So there's not, it's not like, oh, you can get paid to go fishing. You have to do something, a job of some description or... Just give back in a way, don't you? Yeah, you have to give back. So in a way, making it as a fisherman's harder than making it as a dancer by far. But I enjoy fishing more at this moment in time. Yeah. I what This is the crazy thing I always thought about. This is how I kind of level them out in my head. Performing is like you have to train non-stop. I don't enjoy the training and I don't enjoy the rehearsals. I only enjoy when I'm on the stage and there's an audience. The lights are on you and you're doing you're dancing, singing, acting, whatever. And that's for a percentage of your whole career. When you're in, in, in and out of work, you're not mm. doing that all the time. Fishing, there's no practice and there's no performance. Everything is fishing. Going and baiting up, seeing the fish, catching the fish, filming. It's all, all the brilliance of it. Yeah. Performing's like some of it's terrible and setbacks and this and that. The only setbacks in fishing is losing fish. The rest Let's of- talk about that. <laughs> Let's go away. <laughs> what are you trying to make me cry, man? I won't get into there. that one. That's not going to That sounds deep. quite raw on losing oh, fish at the moment. Wounded. But yeah. <laughs> Don't. But yeah, if you get what I mean, it's like fishing's harder, but you enjoy 90% of the experience with fishing, whereas if performing, half of it's yeah. really depressing and a lot of crazy hard work fishing's hard work to carry gear to the spot and that's that to catch the car but you're buzzing while you're going there you're not buzzing mm. while you're training to and hurting your legs stretching to try and better yourself and as, as a dancer it's like fair fair you see what i mean very well explained mate that's how i try well and put it probably waffle a bit but no no it's good going back to lockdown we left off before i completely took you down the wormhole of wherever we went <laughs> um you were uh, you had your fishing boat um, the docks, you had your houseboat, mm-hmm. you'd put the offer in and bought the houseboat. Talk to me about your fishing exploits during that time when you were allowed back fishing and you, you're back based in London. So I believe that one, when the boat, the fishing boat got towed down to London, um, where was I at the time? I think I went back to Stacey's mum's. It was early July. I still stayed at Stacey's mum's house for a little while. And no, it was the end of June and pretty quickly. In fact, I missed one part during the lockdown while I was with my family. Yeah. We were trying to buy the boat. We went, we want it. When we're back in London, we're taking it. And we before going. So you hadn't seen this boat? No, we reviewed it. Oh, okay. We viewed the boat before the lockdown happened and we wanted it, but we went to put an offer in and then the lockdown happened and we said, we've both got no job. If we pay, we're going to pay more in for something. We don't know how long this lockdown's going to last. Mm. So, when we came back to London, it was there ready for us. So we bought it straight away. So I had a fishing boat there in London that I thought, oh, these crazy adventures. Then I had a houseboat, bought a houseboat. And then I was like, what have I done? Way too much stuff going on here. Fishing boat, I've got no time to even fish. I've just bought a new house. <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> yeah, all in. Too too late. Get on with it. And then someone called me and went, I've booked a trip to Belgium. Mates pulled out. Borders paid for. All paid for the canal, Kempish Canal. Yeah. We're off. So okay. this is that part of the lockdown where you could travel, yeah? Yeah, this was end of July. Yeah, God, time is. And we got there, the canal, Kempish Canal, can't fish. They've just closed tonight, twelve o'clock tonight. You're oh. Not allowed out past eleven o'clock. And we were like, really? And then we went round, said places in Belgium. Certain people said, "Oh, this is a good spot. Try this." And Ended up like catching a forty pounder out of the canal. Like, hey, don't gloss over this. Two nights, forty before. pounder. Yeah, there was just a little canal. Um, we went there. We told there's only five or six fish in the stretch. How big's the stretch? Small, eighty yards, and then there's another long stretch next to it. Um, we walked up and down both. Sort of ignored the little one. There's one forty pounder, but only a couple of fish in there. What are the chances of catching it? Went up and down the big one with multiple big fish in. Um, my mate went. Hey, I've just seen them. Called me. I've just found seven fish in the little one. I'm going, seven fish? That's the whole living stock. Ran down there, caught a few small ones, did the night. What sort of methods? Just fishing. At first, we saw them right in the shallows. It was muddy brown. You couldn't see a thing. So that's why I never bothered. The stretch above was crystal clear. All um, lily pads, incredible canal. Um, 
But this small stretch, it was muddy and horrible because there was another canal coming across the side of it that the gates would sort of open and it'd let all this dirty water that'd spin around. It just was grim. But my mate called me and he could see five or six carp and one was the big mirror, mm. this room and 40 pounder. So we got the rods. We snuck into thing near the main road, plonked a rigging right down in the edge. And we mate hooked one, lost it. I hooked one, landed it like a torpedo, long, skinny, common thing. And we were like, let's just do the night here. Yeah. Why not? One of the locals come round and said, oh, the big one tends to come out in the deep water by the lock. And we'd been fishing these shallows trying to catch it on slow seeking bread. And we thought, why not listen to him? Put loads of bait in in the day, wandered up the other canal, did the night. What are we talking? How much bait are you put in? Oh, not loads. Kilo and a half. Just boily? Just bo- scope X boilies. Yeah. And whatever else, what, maybe tigers. Yeah, because I remember fished a big barrel of tigers, so I didn't catch any of the small ones. I just wanted that big one. Yeah. Fished a barrel of tiger, and it's all foam in between each tiger. Really? Flicked it out. My mate fished a foot apart, so we both went, we baited there, let's put a rod a foot a foot apart. And before dark, about eight o'clock, we'd only been set up a few hours. Um, He hadn't caught. So he hadn't caught even one of these little ones? So by, the by this point... We'd not caught anywhere in Belgium. I think it was a 10-day trip. We'd not caught anywhere and everywhere was closed and it was rough and it, we were hot, bothered, and we'd found these fish in this canal. I'd already caught one. His mate had caught... His mate, we went onto the, the longest stretch and I said, oh, there's a few fish there and his mate just plonked a bivy there and he sat there for the whole trip and me, me and the other guy were just up and down, up and down and he had one of the real nice ones out, proper crusty old mirror. Me and him were like, oh, we could have just sat with him and caught. It's a lot easier. Yeah, and in the end, got on this little stretch, flicked a rod out each. He hadn't caught, and he went off in his van to go to the mate, and I was there with the rods, and his rod ripped off. His rod ripped off? I hit it. I called him, mate, get here now. Your rod's gone off, and I knew how gutted he'd be if I netted one for him, because he's just finally hooked one in Belgium, and he's I mean, gone to pick up a, a lighter off his mate down on the other stretch. I rang him, he's come down in the van, got out, took the rod off me. My rod started bleeping, beep, 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 beep. Oh, it's gone over my rod. Mm. The lad's left it, got the net for him. Wee! My rod started zapping and his fish is now close to the edge. And I'm like, no, I'm in. Yeah. Both playing one. Mine comes up first, big thing rolls. He went, it's the mirror. And I was like, no, it is. It's this massive, big, old canal fish just rolled across the top, big stabby back. And I was like, literally heart in the mouth. Yeah. He had, then he had then his one and his rolled. It was a little common. What are the odds? Like, I mean, 15 pound common. He had the first take and mine was this big colossal mirror fishing that far apart. Just what is your look? Yeah. And he just went, I don't even care about mine. He was like, he had, he had the rod and like the lines were dead close. Oh, the fish were like going over each other because we were both playing at the same time. And he went, he went, oh, he was just playing it daft just to get out of the way. And mine was like, I don't, I went, mate, just take time on yours. I want you to get yours in as well. That's and he's like, fish. I don't care about mine, mate. That yours is a chunk. Anyway, yeah, we got the net, <laughs> netted both of these fish, and I've got it on film and that. I'm hoping to make an edit out of it. I've got the whole thing on, like, filmed and everything. We filmed the whole lot. Got it, me going in the net. Yes! <laughs> this big, massive clonk in Belgium. What a result. We caught that one. This one, like, the 40-pounder in that little stretch. And then after that, we realised it was, like, 55 carp in there. Loads well, of, what, in that little stretch? Yeah, loads of small commons. Right. He then went on to catch a, a nearly 30-pound mirror in the night. And a really nice common upper 20. Oh, so they weren't all little ones and just one nah. big one? There was, a... there was a few, but I think there was only a couple of 30s, that 40 and then all, all small ones. That's why everyone fished the long stretch, had all the best fish. Yeah. So I'd had that and it was like, after realised, Jesus, we yeah. just caught that out of 40 fish in there and had the bigger. And I That's was, a great so, result. So the trip ended up being amazing in the end. Went home, back to reality, houseboat, <laughs> fishing boat, left on the river, not even blimmin' moved it for two weeks. And yeah, and it's just like, since then, everyone's just gone, bam, like that. And then just sort of tried to get out fishing. Didn't really have a great year back in London. Fished heavily on wharf and stuff. After that, it must, like, I think I did a bit of filming with Alan, which I sort of didn't fish two weeks up until before. Done a bit of filming for the Urban Banks film, which Alan's still filming for now. Um, Top secret. Top secret. There's another bit of top secret filming we've got to almost yeah. not talk about. So that was that. So I didn't fish for two weeks before that. I just sort okay. of settled on the boat, got the boat stuff done. Then we filmed that and then it was like summer's over. Mm. Out of nowhere. I hadn't really fished, hadn't done any campaigns, hadn't caught loads of fish. Just had that nice one from Belgium and a few of us. Um, did a few parlays, had a few 30 pounders and stuff, but nothing. Yeah, it's just casual. What nothing like the year before. The year before was like 
relentlessly sort of going at it. What thirty pounders have you had from which part? Like, there, you just glossed over them. Can we not speak about them? Mm. They're pretty mega fish, though. Just like nice commons, like really nice thirty pound common. That was just I think just after I did the filming with Alan um, and a few others, and then it was like all sort supposed to be back on the river. Right. On my boat again. Well, yeah. I need to focus for the, this is the best time of year to catch them off the boat before it gets cold. They're all going to be big weights, all that kind of stuff. And the weather was dreadful. Terrible. Do you remember? Um, oh, fuck, it's all October. Blood. Was it rubbish? Oh my God. It was raining every day. Mm. River was flooded. Canal river flooded the whole lot. Couldn't fish off the boat. Boat got broken into, robbed all my stuff out of there. Your fishing boat? Yeah, broken into, robbed everything. Couldn't fish off it. The houseboat was, we didn't really pay any attention to it. We had no time, just went there and slept and left. Ignored it was any work needed to be done. And then we was into winter, and that's the, the campaign on the houseboat dock, which I'm currently still filming. But. Caught a few. Not a lot. I've got a picture of a good one, mate, that I'm going to overload this pod that you've caught. Don't show that one. <laughs> Secret. But yeah, no. But that film will hopefully come out when you've. In five years. When you've worked your way through what you believe yeah, is Yeah, so this is like, for me, this film that we're making, I think for me will be like the main film, like the probably the biggest film I've ever done mm. in terms of it's the golden ticket in terms of the location and the fish and the venue and the style and the houseboat being there. And But at the same time, it's not going to ruin it for anyone because recently the place got taken over as an actual ticket water, so it's limited anglers. Oh, okay. So it's now 150 tickets, that's it, and there's there's people who bream fish and perch fish and lure fish, and then there's a, a head of carp anglers, most of which live in the postcode. If you live out, you're on the waiting list. So when I do, I don't want to make a film now, because then obviously it gives away all the little things I'm doing to all the locals, and then then it will jeopardise my fishing on off the houseboat for the next however many years, but... It's one of them, when it does come out, it'll be like one of those that I hope doesn't upset too many people and it'll just be like purely enjoyable for the fact that no one can just come in and fish there. And no, it, yeah. But it is still unknown fish to some extent and sort of really special carp. What so. have you seen? Personally, yeah. the best fish I've seen I've caught. Right. Um, the best three or four I've seen I've caught, um, one of which has been like a really special one that I've seen pictures of before. Um, cause I fished this place where the houseboat is years ago. I remember when me and Stacey were looking for the, for somewhere to keep this houseboat cause you have to get more in, in London. Yeah. I couldn't, originally I was going to get a, like a canal boat and go up and down the canal and live on it. But looking back we're now having the fishing boat in that scenario, that would have been a nightmare to live off yeah. because you'd have to move every two weeks. Then you're at a different station to get to work and there's no, like where the houseboat is, the shower and toilet facilities, yeah. a fob to get in. So it's that, it feels like a little community. So yeah, sorry, I waffled there. Where where were we at? No, we were talking about what you'd seen in there. What I'd seen. Um, so I've caught yeah. two, two, three years ago, I'd fished there. So when, that's what I was on about. So when we were looking at these marinas, where to get this houseboat, that was the cheapest one. And I was doing a job at the time. I was doing a pantomime in Harlow. Yeah. And when we were looking for this houseboat and um, Stacey's gone, oh, these are a few of the options. And I went, yep, yeah, that one. She went, you're just saying that because of fishing, aren't you? No. No, it's cheap. It's lovely, it's cheap. I called Definitely. the Harbour Master, was genuinely by far the cheapest one. They had a boat going, it's the cheapest boat we could find at that time. Mm. And I was just like, and it's the fish are incredible in there. Massive dock, deep as anything. That's like a serious campaign water for years. So that was all perfect in the sense of that. But I had fish there and caught some really cool carp from there before. So as of yet, I haven't seen any fish in there that are like, oh my God, that is like breaking like that's incredible yeah but a lot of people that I trust and that I believe wouldn't just make things up for the fun of it people that live around there reckon they've seen some colossal fish yeah some nice. big big fish that rumours have been seen on the bank and someone's caught and let them go and not took took a picture but not sent it to anyone and like ridiculous carp but until I see it myself I don't believe it but I'm there to see them yeah watch them spawn for the first time last week First year, watch them spawning. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Like yeah. 30 pound armor plated thing. And I was like, I'm so glad I've caught that. <laughs> so I'd, I'd just be like, come here. Yeah. Like when you see them that close, because where the boat is, I'm the bank's all high and where the house bit is, is on a dropped floating pontoons. Okay. So they're not scared of us because we're on the boats. They're yeah. scared of people on the bank. You can't fish in them. Yeah, you'd be on the skyline. 
you can't fish in that marina. Yeah. There's a little channel going to the main marina where you can fish. So I can't fish off the houseboat. I have to walk my gear around to where you're allowed to fish. So it's an even playing field. I've not got any advantage over the other anglers on the ticket. No. Which makes me feel better in a way that I'm catching them properly. properly. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. just flicking a rod off my boat. But I get to see them off the boat in the natural environment where they're not scared of being fished for. And they're like taking bits of leaves at my feet. That would and kill it, me. Today even. I was with Bradley this morning. Whoop. I've and just was, dropped a mixer like, with a hook over It's like the a mid-20, like, black leather just coming up, taking mixers. Mad. I can't fish from. So, essentially, your campaign is going to be that. There should be a video in a, in a few years, but already you've had some pretty epic results. Yeah. Talk to me about campaign fishing on, I don't want to make it specific to where you are, but on rivers. How do you go about... Establishing bait, picking areas, because there's a lot of considerations you've got to think about with regards to other people, with regards to, I mean, you're talking, some of these are how deep, the docks? 34. Yeah, exactly. You're not just fishing like a little shallow canal. Do you know what I mean? The dock is like, I don't think there's, any, I was thinking about it all winter. I was sitting there like a, like a bank tramp. Mm. No skill involved. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The only skill is the determination to go there and consistently fish there and put a sharp hook out. Silty, Thames water comes in, grim water, the fish can't see the bottom. There's no way a certain technical rig slips them up. Yeah. Any of that rubbish, the line, they're not going to care. Like, it's not like you're fishing a gravel spot for a 50 that's like super elusive and comes in the edge. It's literally casting out into a dock that's deep, silty as anything. As long as you've got presentation like helicopters, and they've got a boilie out there. When the fish move in, you catch them every time. What presentation are you putting out there? I, all winter, I just fish Scopex boilies because yeah. a lot of bream. Big uns? No, just 15 millers. Right. Just scattered Scopex with boilies in the area of the boat, fished away from the boat, hoping that they draw the fish away from them. Mm. Um, and I caught doing that just with a little standard Ronnie rig. hate to say it. Go on, the Ronnie. Ronnie, get up there. The Ronnie. Another one. <laughs> um... Yeah, and that's how I caught in the winter. And that's how I remember the first time I ever fished there, that dock. My mate called me and went, I've just had a fish from this dock. I've never fished here before. It's £30 for the ticket. Come down. I went down um, in the middle of January and I caught six on singles. Didn't put any bait out. Six? Didn't even have any bait. Took a bed chair and a tent. Only had one rod. And I just flicked out in, randomly to this boat and I had six carp in one night. And that's apparently that's the most fish I've ever been caught in one night ever. Yeah. And then I just did 40 nights in the winter for six fish. Did you? And that three years ago, I caught six in one night. So I know they're not rigging hard to catch just when they're there. Oh, it's when they're there, yeah. And then when are they there? It's How much bait are you putting in? Not a lot. You fished it the winter primarily fished here, have the winter, you? I probably put, probably put 10 kilo in leading up to my first trip, which was start of November. And I caught the, the first trip, yeah. which was a touch. Um, but yeah, I'm just baiting... Baiting enough so that if a group of fish move over, they can feed and leave and come back and they're still bait, but not too much that it's like you've blown it if one fish comes in and I've got a rig there and it, yeah. I won't get a bite. So kind of that kind of style. But yeah, it's like with that dock, it's like, I was thinking all winter, what would Terry do? What would all these top anglers do? Terry do. What would all these, well, the best of the best anglers, what would they do if they were fishing here? And I genuinely don't believe they could do any, anything. But what, what can you do? No. Like, can you drive out a sonar? No, because there's a million bream, all ten pound bream. So you just it just be look like there's fish everywhere. So you can't like locate the carp that way. It's muddy and horrible in the winter. You can't see anything. So it's like you can't see fizz, all the bottom erupts fizzing nonstop. You don't, can't see fizzing. You don't know what's the difference between a fish and the bottom. And then they never show. So what? You just go off previous. That's all you could do. Yeah. Yeah, and even Polish. Um, Polish he, is Polish um, Matthew Instagram name Polish Carper Polish Carper there you go he fished it the year after he's lived around that area for years okay. so he's caught and put some in there and things like that when he was a kid put fish out of little canals in there and sort of caught a few off the top years ago and he fished there properly the year after I had that random six fish here I never went there again and he fished there the year after me and he had loads there's a picture of him with and him and Jack Barrett and them boys all holding them up. All loads what, of shit. what stamp of fish are we talking? 20 all pounders, bangers, just really nice really? 20 pounders. And they smashed it up in the middle of winter. With like <laughs> four fish. Like they, I think they only had 10 each because it is rock hard. Yeah. 40, 50 fish stock. 
but they're having like four in the morning for two mornings. I had like eight fish each, whatever, in a little little two week spell. Yeah. He did, sat next to me this winter and did ten nights, caught nothing, and just see you later, gone. Mm. Fishing the exact same swim, the same time of year, on the same big southwesterly wind in January, you'd think, oh, they're blasting, all the wind's blasting down. It smashes off the boat and churns into the sh- slightly shallower area from thirty foot to twelve. That was our theory. Southwesterly is blowing down 30 foot, hitting the boats in the 12 foot area, churning it, warming it up. They're having it. That's how he caught them. That's how I caught the six. Done loads of nights fishing on them wins, nothing. Mm. What do you do? Well, this, you can't. There's just just you have to put time in. Yeah. But now it's a different story. Now it's crystal clear. You can see an eight foot of water where they're coming in and feeding. You can put 20 tigers and come back in the morning, gone. Fish have been there, do the night. But I'm not fishing there now. That's the worst part. I've said I'm not fishing there in the summer. Why? Because it's so close to home. If I fish there in the summer, then where am I fishing in the winter? Because the winter in London's awful. I don't have a car, so I'd have to get on the train with all my gear, fish muddy park lakes and be freezing, then get back on the train. The docks is, like, beautiful. I can just carry my gear, all concrete banks Mm. in the winter. I carry all food with me and stuff and comfortably fish. So I don't bother fishing it in the summer when I could probably catch them a lot easier. But if they're catchable in the winter, which they are, I caught seven. Yeah. Um, why not f- have that as my winter water? Difficult so, one. So what's the summer then? Summer for me is just trying to catch as many target fish as physically possible. I never really fish for bites, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're fishing for fish. I'm not like you? a monster carp mm. angler. Just like certain fish that I really like the look of. Canal fish, upper 20s, dark ones, nice park lake fish that I've seen pictures of and ones I've seen in the water. Just whatever's kind of motivates me to go out and fish for. Obviously, in the filming aspect, like I've recently started making videos for Carp Fix. Yeah. Um, so obviously, Daryl started Carp Fix alongside his stuff with Corda, where he sort of documents his private fishing. Um, and recently, they've been looking to expand, and they asked me if I was willing to make some videos for them. So in that kind of style and some of the films, hopefully I'll be making with Nash as well, is is a bit different to what I do in terms of I will go fishing places where it's, I can go for bites and catch fish and enjoy myself. Mm. Whereas if my style of angling is that targeting them fish, going back to before, they're the places where you shouldn't really film because of the backlash. So yeah, of course. It's finding the balance, basically. But yeah, for me, summer's all just going around. I don't really I don't really go... Some people have like crazy success just fl- fluttering around and just catching big uns just on so seeking bread. Just going there on a hot day and, and then I'm like, oh, why didn't I do that? Polish smashed yeah. it up the other week. He's had like a season's worth of fishing two weeks. Just going just round, opportunist, bro. getting off, yeah. after work, going on the bus and just fishing a random lake and just catching the biggest fish in there because they're all dumb after spawning and they're just up for a bit of bread and he's the one who's gone there and caught them. And I'm here grafting, baiting up, targeting one lake and the fish isn't feeding or someone else has it and I'm like, sets me back three months. That's your terms, isn't but it? But that's my style and yeah. I think like over time, consistently that pays off. Because you'll constantly kind of, you will eventually catch every other target you go for that year. You should catch a few of them. Mm. And that's kind of the style I go for. Like sort of one place, bait it, being in tune with that one venue at one time. But this is where the boat's a nightmare. Houseboat is always fish swimming around and it sidetracks me. Then the fishing boat I have to go to to move. Yeah. That part lake's the big ones due out. I'm like all over the place, too much going on. But yeah, I try to just focus on one place and catch one fish. And then once I've caught that, I move on to the next. And I've got like an album of, I want that, 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 and that. And that's for that year. Last year, I had six target fish. I caught none of them. That's what I mean in terms of that side. Last year was dreadful. I still caught fish and had a great year and loads of things happened. But in terms of target, special target fish, I had on my my tick list, I caught none of them. Hopefully this year's going to be... Different. Hopefully. Yeah. It will be, I'm sure, mate. But you've had a busy one full stop. The houseboat has been an absolute nightmare, hasn't it? You were telling me before, like, it's been out of the water. You've had to spend X yeah, and Y so on it. Th- that filming I did with On The Dock all winter was ended, Didn't wasn't really a full winter. I did November and December and it ended. So I did only did eight weeks, 30 odd nights. Figure that one out. Stacey wasn't happy, put it that way. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> is she not on there at the time, though? Stacey was she's on the, the house. She's on you're the house, but she's you're also the... staying at her mum's house a lot okay. because she's working, still teaching at her old dance school. Right. So that for me worked out well because otherwise I'd just be leaving her on the house, but all the time. Mm. So that worked out well. But um, yeah, that was that lockdown came into play, end of December. So yeah. I didn't, I couldn't carry on the winter campaign. And then the boat come out of the water. It was supposed to be a quick paint job survey. 
Oh. Ended up spending like six, seven thousand pounds on it. We had to strip it back to steel and repaint. We had to get welders in to fit the new roof and hatch back in. It was all supposed to be a perfect boat. We had no money to do the work. It was rough, mate. Yeah, and that I'm com- sweating out here, mate. Yes. Why did I put a shirt on? Good, mate. It's, but it looks good. You're looking all cool and fresh. Oh, I've been in all fine. You're hot. I'm. I wouldn't say I'm hot, mate. I'd say I'm warm. I wouldn't say hot. Yeah, <laughs> I'm boiling. <laughs> It's good, mate. It's Why did I wear a shirt? It's, it's like good, 30 mate. 30 degrees. No, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of other things that have been um, pretty full on, you talked a little bit about carp fix, but also you've been doing a bit with Fisher Looks, haven't you? The yeah. raffle side. Yeah, so that as well, which hasn't been too sort of, I wouldn't put that in the schedule of being overran by it because it's kind of a once every two week thing. Yeah. Um. So James, um, who... Develop, develop the brand yeah um, sort of had the idea of taking that kind of raffle thing to the next level yeah so he like bought all these machines from China spent a load of money on getting like a lot of hot picks rolling balls instead of just like sort of on a laptop picking at a random out of a hat for a ticket and you're the winner it's like tune in and making it like a show which we're still working towards at the moment it's just the raffle but eventually it's going to be a show like a game show with the raffle at the end Right. So that's the intention with it. There's a few things that we want to do. I can't necessarily talk about too much, but obviously Dave Levy's involved as well. Yeah. Um. So that's that. He asked me to do that during the lockdown, and he was set back by the lockdown himself. But yeah. as soon as I come back to London, that was something else that I started doing. So every two weeks, I go there and sort of present, if you like, the um... and the tackle shop as well, which you were telling me in the car. Yeah. Has wounded you very recently, but yeah. So the t- that, oh mate, I feel like I'm waffling. But what is this year? It's been crazy. It's been busy for you, hasn't it? So during the first lock, just before the first lockdown back in March, yeah. Before I decided to go and live with family, I started a tackle shop in the aquarium I was working at. So while I was fishing and dancing, not earning a lot of money, I thought I'm working in this shop, cleaning fish tanks, trying to dance, struggling to get the jobs I want, and then loving my fishing what can I do to sort of do something I enjoy that I can still do my fishing and have my time for my dancing? I thought, let me ask the boss if he'll let me sell some fishing tackle within the business. Yeah. And he was really kind and let me get on my feet. So I got an account with Nash to start off with, Dynamite, Corda, and um, yeah, to sort of slowly put a thousand pound in of my own savings and then went off up north with my family and just left it all just to stand with all this gear on. I was never there. I come back and it was nearly all gone. Mm. And people had just walked in and randomly just took things off the shelf, paid for it. And with that money, I bought a little bit more gear, started getting the bait, and eventually started I mean, taking over the shop. Yeah. And now it's this thing that I've put like two days a week. Like I've done everything. And it's like not something that I've got any experience in, in terms of sort of opening accounts and, and all no. making payments, business accounts, all that kind of thing. I've done all myself. And it's just been like, and trying to balance the houseboat as well. But every penny I've, all the stuff, thankfully, like all of the sales have come from Instagram. Yeah. So like I've got loads of like, yeah, like all the people who buy the stuff off me, like super kind and they all want to support my business as it's obviously growing and stuff like that, which is obviously without them, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, cause I've had no website and no one walks in the shop in the middle of London to buy fishing tackle. So it's- I, I see it on your story all the time, mate. You do a great job there in terms of like, yeah, promoting that and you've developed it from something that was mainly aquatics. Like you say now, try there's and- a fair bit in there, mate. You've done a good job. Yeah. I built it up and I think I got a bit carried away and put every single penny of the sales into more tackle and didn't take anything for myself, which is obviously the way to build a business anyway, mm. and take all the money from it. But yeah, I think I, went a bit too guns blazing, a bit too quick for what I could manage. Um, backfired a little bit recently <laughs> in terms of I've spent a lot of money building an extension without the the um, backing and necessarily the correct planning permissions and all that kind of malarkey and it's all... Cool. I'm sure it'll pay off long Hopefully term. Hopefully but... I sort it all out, yeah. But it's just like, it's a full-time job. Yeah. And is it what I want to do? Not really. And that goes back to, again, that thing of whatever I do, I want to do it because I love it and it's not a job. And it was just a, at first selling fish and tackle. I can serve customers personally. I can deal with all my customers who message me on Instagram and have a nice chat about fishing and genuinely give them honest feedback on what gear I think I'll help catch carp, help them tie rigs in the shop if they're new to fishing. Mm. And then it's got, because it's got bigger, can you get that? No, but I will order in excess stuff that won't even fit in the shop. 
and it's just extra stress that I don't need when yeah. I've got the houseboat trying to film. And so yeah, it's get it's got to that point where it could go to the next level, um, but I need to make big steps. That I don't yeah. Know. So it's yeah, it's a difficult one. A lot has happened in a year. In terms of you and your advice to people who would want to go maybe look at doing some urban fishing. And I'm not just talking about in London, I'm talking about wherever maybe urban to them, mm-hmm. in whatever district, there's Birmingham, there's loads of different river networks everywhere. What would you say are the important things that have led to you being successful? Because you've come into London, not necessarily knowing the scene, mm-hmm. and done well. Yep. What, what are the key things that people need to consider? Super hard. I, I think what I was saying about Carl and Alex with their whole content, like I could probably watch them. Like I watch videos of Carl, uh, Alex, sorry, going around picking up mushrooms. It's nothing to do with fishing, mm. but it's because it, they've got to a stage where they've engaged the audience so much in their life and what they do to you enjoy just watching them doing whatever it is. Obviously, preferably fishing content, but I think... Don't chase what's obviously chase what's trendy in terms of it will elevate your platform quicker because there's more people with eyes on it. But at the same time, if you're doing something just because it's trendy and it's because you think that's the quickest way to get yourself to to where you want to get to, I don't think that's necessarily the right way to go about it. I think, like I said, if I was making all these videos up north, maybe I wouldn't have ever got this sort of built up this platform. But I believe still I would have made content and people would have still enjoyed it to some degree. So I think it's not necessarily, I think just enjoy it. Yeah. If you enjoy it and you go out and you genuinely, like if you don't like fishing for big carp and you just want to go round and, and get bites, like Alan, one of the biggest names in carp fishing, yet he openly would say that he he loves going and getting bites yeah. and catching small fish and people make a joke when he holds up two small commons, but then they're like queuing to speak to him because they're inspired by what he does and they love that whole positive aspect of how he goes out and does his thing. So I think whatever you want to do and whatever sort of gives you the bug, that will tell to your audience and then they will then be inspired by what you're getting excited by. I see. Do you know what I mean? It's like you can't do one thing and go, like I couldn't go and smash up a little part they can catch those little ones and the same way like Alan does or other anglers like that will go do a Carl and Alex and try and copy Mm. what they're doing because it's trendy because it wouldn't really suit what the style of fishing I do. I get I get that taking out the whole sort of developing an audience social side of stuff. If somebody just wanted to give it a go, nothing to do with making it in the industry. Nothing to do. Just, just fishing to in go London. fishing in those sort of urban environments, whether it be a river, a canal, or somewhere that's like unknown with regards to a lot of the stock, because that's the situation yeah, you've yeah. come into. What would be then your sort of key things to to sort of think about? I'd say probably the same as most venues in terms of carp's a carp and it will do what a carp does. Obviously, certain places are pressured in different ways, but if you walk around the lake enough times, whether it's in the middle of the forest or it's got buildings all around it, you'll eventually see something that will give give it away. If you put enough time in, um, Jack Forbidden Roots drives into London in his car in the, mid, in the middle of summer, does a day, catches fish in London, and he's never asked me where to fish or never asked anyone else where to fish. He just comes in and goes on Google Maps and looks for park lakes and catches fish. And I think that's kind of, if you just go there and put effort in, you'll find the fish. I think it is, obviously there's perks of being already there because there's some places you just will not see the carp. Yeah. And you need to pre-bait a spot and be there the next morning and see if the bait's gone. And then obviously, but there's always places where you can just rock up in London and, and catch fish. I think the same as you would anywhere else. It just obviously they're not they're not spoke about and mm. then it's not put to you on a plate like it would be if you type like there's videos on Pick's Cottage so you can see all we caught on the surface over there. Well, that island does quite good bites, ten wraps. London is like you what you struggle to find anywhere that gives the game away. So you yeah. like it's like a blank canvas. But in a certain way that's the best style of Yeah. That's the best because then you don't know anything. You don't know what's in there, where to fish, and it's when you catch one. Like so even now, I catch fish, and I'm like, could be the first time it's ever been caught. Exactly, probably been caught ten times. But if you don't know, if you don't know any other, I think that's the appeal. And I think lockdown, in a way, has helped because obviously everybody at a period had to fish locally. Yeah, 
And if you are in relatively sort of urban areas or you're looking at venues you wouldn't normally fish because you can't travel, the opportunities are there, but you just discount them because I'm guilty of it. I'll go to the, the same waters, rural, wherever they may be that I'm used to fishing, and you don't really give it a chance. Oh, I was, I've done a bit around the Thames, and I was shocked the first time I went up there and realised quite just how big a head of carp there actually is. Because you... you it's not talked about. And the Thames is vast. Yeah, it's massive. So there's, in terms of how big it is, there's hardly any. No, but, but... If you're... Yeah, you can see concentration. Focused, tunnel visioned on the Thames one stretch, then it'll become like when people on the outside go, oh, where do you reckon to start? How do you even reply to that? When yeah. you're in that zone, it's like you have to be in the zone, in that bubble, on that in that place at the right time to even come close to catching the fish. If you yeah. just rock up on the Thames and... And pub chuck out into the middle. Can you can you catch? Yeah, but chances are you won't. Yeah. So it just takes like I think fishing in London can take a little bit more effort in terms of um, planning and trips and how many times you pre bait. Most of my fishing's baiting. Yeah. So, so how like, often? For, I do fish a lot for pre baiting. How often are you are you trying to introduce bait into an area? So like if I'm fishing for target fish, not filming just for myself, I probably bait four or five times before I even fish the place. Mm. I go there, try and find the fish. If I can't find them, I bait two, three areas. If I can find them, I bait as close to where I saw them as possible. And how do you gauge the the amount and and what you're putting in? Because you might not know the stock in there. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Do you I, have never like put, a, I never put a lot of bait out. Do you not? No, even when I fish big park lakes with multiple big fish in them and loads of small pest commons like, little cricket bats that just eat all the bait. <laughs> I still can't put loads of bait in because I'm limited to putting loads of bait in anyway because I can't carry that much on the train. Yeah. So it's maximum five kilo ever. But if I but five kilo is so much bait. Yeah. If you put it out with a throwing stick across a massive football-sized pitch area on a massive reservoir, then it's not. But I'm going there and sort of putting it all under a tree. If you put one kilo, it looks like yeah. shining Lights. and all the other people can see your bait and you're like, ooh. Yeah. It's just like, oh, you need 30 boilies come back the next day. If there's no coots there diving and there's no birds in the area and the bait's gone, you, you assume that the carp are fed and then you do it again and then the next time you fish. Mm. And then more often than not, you catch. Then just keep doing it. Like, keep going and, and then eventually you catch the big and other times you don't and it spooks off because its mate got caught and then you have to fish another part of the lake and that's where you can get all deep with it. But normally it's just... Yeah. Most but- of the fish I've had is no crazy depth of skill and no. kind of oh with the little girls spooked and find them feed yeah, them found catch them. the rig and just feed them go there catch them because yeah. it's just central london not many people fish there they're not used to getting fed high protein boilies and all these crazy things they're getting used to eating bird poo and seeds and crap so if you're throwing in really good bait <laughs> particle boilies they go mad for it they're waiting okay. when you get there most of the time and the, the most important thing is getting the rig in yeah. without spooking them that's the old job. I need to give the old urban scene a bit more thought, even up near me. There's definitely opportunities I'm missing out on, but I will definitely at some point. You just mate. need somewhere with a fish that just blows your mind so that you got that motivation. Oh, I'm happy with anything. I've, I've, I'm, yeah, I'm untapped. After mate, last week. Urban, just, yeah, <laughs> just keeping one on the end. Jeez, got some trebles. No, don't do that. Um, thank you so much, mate, for coming. Before you go, you do have to do the old Nash quick fire questions. You'll, you'll breeze these. I have to find them because I can never remember them, mate. Cool. Um, no trick ones. Ready? There's no real trick ones. They're going to catch me out. <laughs> um, right, UK 50 or foreign 70? UK 50. Bait, boat or baiting pole? Baiting pole. Very quick. Would you rather experience carp fishing 20 years ago or 20 years in the future? 20 years ago. Dawn or dusk? Dusk. Never use a shelter again or never use a bed chair again? Bed chair or shelter? Which one are you losing? Mm. Think about the hair. Bed chair. <laughs> He's got the shelter. Not safe without the bed. The bed. Oh yeah, security. I forgot about that. Would Someone you rather be... slap you in the face when you're lying there? <laughs> <laughs> you got the bivy. You can just sleep on a on a mattress. Nice. Um, <laughs> be a professional angler or a professional footballer. Angler. Ooh. Hate well, football. Do you? Hate it. Everything about it. Controversial. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> I've lost well, all my followers. 
<laughs> Always torrentially rainy when you're fishing or 30 degrees and baking hot. Sorry, say that again. Always torrentially rainy when okay. you're fishing or 30 degrees and baking hot. Baking hot. Would you rather catch 10 20 pounders or 140? 140. For the rest of your life, you can only listen to drum and bass or country and western. Country and western. I hate drum and bass. Ooh. Sorry, Nash. <laughs> I can't stand drum and bass. I'm, I like any kind of music, but drum and bass and like electro and all that crazy stuff. Because I'm, I like stuff I can dance to. Drum and bass is you just can like smash them shapes out. Drum, drum and bass, bass is just. Surely. Oof, oof, oh, you've oof. got it. And just doing that, I like stylized. I like R and B. Don't really like rap, but R and B, anything other than drum and bass, country. So I have to go country. Mate. A bit of Tennessee whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a bucket or dig a hole. Uh, bucket with a plastic bag in it. Nice. Would you rather fish a two-week session without changing your socks or Sorry, a two-week session without changing your underwear? My feet reek, so I'd have to be. I'd have to change the socks. Um, hook bait colour choice, bright or match the hatch? Bright. Camo or olive? Camo. Final question. Date night with the missus on the houseboat or... Fish on the end of a big pressure drop and a fresh southwesterly. The thought process. Is she watching? Is she watching? She, will she, will watch she lock me out? No, I'll have to say. Fishing, yeah. No, no, we'll have to <laughs> go with the partner. Nice. Because say, you don't right. guarantee to catch. If you said I caught a 50, I'd say, well, we can go on a date next week. <laughs> you not have date night by the side of the sort of houseboat in the fishing area? No? Oh, yeah. But if if the choice was... Have a date night with Stacey or have to fish on the end of a wind southwesterly. I'd have to go for the date night because that's guaranteed. Catching's not guaranteed. That's guaranteed. What have you just said there to end this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> but you're there, you know what I mean? You I can't, know, mate, you can't. Fo- I'm, I already get away with murder. I'd fish way too much. You just um, like, I feel you're in a hole now. I'm so it. lucky that she lets me go out them as much as I do. So Good save. Yeah. You were in a big hole there. Big hole, climbed Found out. Ladder. Found a ladder. Um, Jacob, thank you so much for coming in, sharing your update on things. We will definitely catch up with you soon, I'm sure. Uh, I look forward to seeing that campaign video when it's finally done in a few years. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Please leave a review. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you again soon with another Nash Off The Hook podcast. Cheers, Thanks, mate. Hassan, nice to see you, mate. Thanks for the invite. <laughs>